Hey everyone, I'm Dean Arnold. Uh, first name Trevor, I don't use that too often. Uh, I go by Dean. I am a PhD student at Cornell in the Applied Economics and Management School. Um, I'm a first year. Um, before this, I was working at the e, e lab at UChicago um, and actually kind of still do some work with them, but we could get into that later. Um, excited to talk with you all today. Are you still going? Yeah. Um, okay. Still haven't resolved my issues, but don't worry. We can still figure this out. Um, I'll just tell you so when I'm done. I'll first, motion that I finish answering the question. I guess you can't hear me, so that was you. Oh, wait. No, I can hear you now. See there we again? go. Great. No. Okay. You're a little delayed, but I don't care. Um, so awesome. Um, sorry, I didn't hear what you previously said. But um, let's first talk about your experience with E&E &E Lab and what you've been doing there. Um, and since we didn't get a chance to talk about beforehand, um, are you still there with them while you're doing your program or um, have you moved on yeah. from that role? Yeah, so um, I work part time with um, faculty still who are on these projects that we started at the e, e lab, so still partly affiliated. Um, but mostly since I'm a first year in an economics PhD, I mostly do coursework and then it's sort of uh, keeping up with projects that we started that had delays and other complications due to COVID and other reasons. So um, continuing to do that work as well. Okay, awesome. Um, do you have anything else do you want to talk about with Enel about how you got involved with them or um, yeah, so any advice for getting involved with that someone someone something someone's interested in? Yeah, so I um, started working at E, &E Lab directly after um, finishing my master's at Harris in the MPP degree. Um, so I started on a research fellowship that they had offered just for that year, but they offer year-round PAs and or project associates and summer internships as well. So definitely worth, worth looking into if you like uh, the work that I'll describe in just a second here. So we mostly focus on RCTs and um, other inference um, methods to analyze energy and environment programs or policies or other anomalies that are, are happening in the world. Um, and so I focus mostly on starting some of our projects up in New York. Um, we have a partner there who we are starting an RCT with in the next month or so, um, but they also have been nice, en nice enough to lend us some data to look into um, and explore some other ideas as well. So I do some data analysis, but most of my time when I was in um, a full-time you know, staff at the lab was um, starting these new projects, doing this um, our, getting this RT, RCT set up and getting all of our partners on board um, to, to do this study. Um, so yeah, a bit of analysis, a bit of project management, I guess, at the same time. Awesome. How is it doing both working part-time and doing school? Uh, it's really tough. Um, I think it is not always too advised by um, professors who um, send their students into PhD programs, but uh, this was one of those things that, you know, we have this study lined up. We finally got everyone on board to run this RCT, um, and, you know, we kind of couldn't drop the ball there, and I still wanted to be involved, so uh, I stayed with it, working a few hours per week, making sure everything was running smoothly, um, and so it was difficult though, because your first year is your core coursework for an econ PhD. And at the end, you have to take a qualifying exam. So a lot of professors will recommend that you just mostly focus on your coursework so that you could pass those quals and focus on your research in the, in the second year and onwards. So um, it was difficult, but uh, I think we'll be fruitful if I could make it through, pass the quals, yeah. Awesome. Um, so let's dive in a little bit more about that program. Um, 
and what you are currently working on, um, what you want to accomplish with this, um, and then I guess what brought you to this program. Yeah, so my way into the program was pretty long and circuitous, I guess. Uh, I went to Harris specifically to learn more about economics. Um, to learn how to code um, and learn how to uh, and catch up on some math requirements that I had to kind of get into an econ PhD. And so, you know, went into Harris thinking I wanted to do this PhD at the end um, and kind of took the advice that I found online and through professors to, you know, take certain math requirements and statistics and other um, coursework such as that, and then also get my hands dirty and do some RA jobs. So I worked for a number of professors while I was there, really unrelated to my field entirely. Um, I did um, a job, I did an RA job with Austin Wright at Harris, who we were doing um, kind of this network analysis um, where I got to use R and learn how to use some of the tools in the, in the, in the mapping package they have. Um, and then I worked, you know, did some other research in political science, also very unrelated to things that I want to do now. Um, but I think these RA jobs are really helpful to introduce me to how research is done and, and how to complete a project and um, be a good RA. Um, and so after that, I realized I still wanted to kind of figure out my niche within, you know, what I wanted to study. And I was a bit hesitant about starting the PhD right away. Um, just because I had no full-time research experience, which is kind of what a lot of people look for now uh, in those applications. So decided to do, um, was lucky enough to get hired at E&E &E and um, focus more on my field of interest, which has kind of always been energy and environment. And so it was nice to be able to dig into the field a bit more. And I think it really improved kind of what I wrote about in my statement of purpose and uh, gave me a much clearer direction about what I wanted to uh, focus on going into, you know, pursuing my own uh, research agenda uh, by starting this program. And so kind of a long way to get to here, but um, yeah, lucky enough to be here at Cornell now. Awesome. Um, so what does your typical day look like? And like, what are you working on, on you know, just in a regular day outside of E&E stuff? <laughs> outside of E&E. Um, yeah, so typical day, um, I guess I have at least one, one to three courses a day usually, um, and then research meetings in between those uh, that I'll have with our partner, either to make sure, you know, um, things are running smoothly on, on that end or um, with the faculty that we're working with to catch them up on what um, sort of progress we've made and, um, you know, discuss any problems or solutions that have, have came up in putting the study together. And then um, also kind of shooting figures and tables back and forth with them and getting them refined as needed. And so um, I didn't do a lot of coding um, throughout my semester, at least for the RA job, but um, definitely picking up a lot more now since I'm uh, on break right now for the next few weeks. All right. So how many people are in your program, um, if you know, and in your cohort? So there are, oh, in the whole program, I would say, oh, I don't know, maybe around 40 to 50 uh, mm -hmm. across all years. My year is a much larger cohort. We have 18 people in, mm -hmm. in our year, but the year before us was 14, uh, which I think is more of the norm, is around that 14 uh, number. Gotcha. How often are you working with or connecting with those people in your cohort, or are you mostly siloed in your own work? Um, we work together all the time, um, mainly because of, you know, yeah, we're focusing on coursework right now. So a lot of it is um, working together on problem sets and doing those sorts of things, but um, also just discussing research and our general plans. Um, it's a very, I think the faculty at Cornell are really good at um, being available for students and do a lot of events to make us feel like we could 
talk to them and ask them for mentorship and things of that sort. So um, it's nice to kind of bounce ideas back and forth off of uh, faculty and, and the other students as well. Um, so I would say, yeah, we work together on a lot of stuff and it seems like a place where we all feel safe and comfortable talking about our research ideas and um, discussing, you know, best strategies to pursue them. Whether that be, you know, do you think this faculty member would be a good chair or, you know, do you think this person would be good on my committee, things of that sort. Yeah. Um, so within your cohort or any other um, people in the program that you've come across, like what are the, some of their common paths to this program? Have a lot of them taken on that time to be full time researchers or a lot of them coming from different industries or other experience? Like, do you have an idea of what that looks like? So Cornell specifically is mostly an environment and food type of program. The, the applied economics program, they hire a lot of students for food and agriculture, economics, and then environmental econ is another big track. And they also do a lot of development. Um, and then their fourth field of interest or that they hire a lot for is for finance as well. So those are kind of the four main, the main um, tracks that people take. Um, in the applied econ uh, department. Um, and so as far as what they did beforehand, I think many, I think the average age must be around 27. Uh, I think most people have um, some RA or a master's beforehand or both. Uh, I think it's pretty common. Um, I think, I can't think of a single maybe one person who came straight from undergrad that I could think of um, in our program. Impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a couple other questions about the PSG program, but I like to save those just in case the audience um, is a little quiet later during our, during our Q&A. Um, but since we did start a tad late, um, I can, I'm going to jump us into your time at Harris and we'll talk about that for a little bit and then we'll go into a little bit about um, future looking. Um, so sure. while I, and I know you already talked about a little bit, a little bit of this, but we'll, we'll go back a bit. Um, while you were at Harris, um, you knew the entire time you were going to go straight to a PhD program afterwards, correct? Yeah, I was, I was kind of sure, but again, the Harris was, experience was kind of to make sure that it was something I definitely wanted to do. Um, but I definitely went into it thinking, I want to do a PhD after this. And, and so that kind of changed how I approached the program compared to most, I think. Yeah. And then how did you decide on Harris anyway? <laughs> on Harris specifically? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I just knew there was a really strong um, energy faculty base at Harris. Um, and so I kind of wanted to be connected to that community. Um, a few things that I did that I'm sure a lot of you uh, here are doing actively, especially now that we're on able to do this on Zoom is attend. I attended a lot of seminars. Um, I met with a lot of faculty, uh, asked them for help on pretty much everything. <laughs> um, whether that be what courses to take, uh, what job to take, what internships to look for, things of that sort. And so, um, you know, I didn't know going into going to Harris that that would be the, the thing that, you know, kind of separated it from the rest of, from other schools or programs, but I found it to be, you know, kind of the most rewarding and uh, part of the experience. So you did say the faculty was really uh, great with that kind of stuff. Did you work with a specific mentor or advisor during your time um, who helped you? Um, I, maybe not one specific person. I fielded questions all the time to um, a lot of the faculty um, at Harris. So, but I think, um, so like Steve Sakala and uh, Professor Ito, Professor Gina, Professor uh, Kellogg, uh, Wolski, I pretty much met with as many of the energy folks as I could to All try to- All of Epic faculty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone at Epic, I bothered um, to help me with one thing or another. Um, but I think specifically Amir Gina was very helpful in, in getting me um, 
kind of situating me in what, you know, economics is about, what we do in environmental econ, um, and why, you know, how to kind of make your path and, um, you know, it's just, it was very helpful in, in um, helping me understand kind of economics as a profession. And so um, if you have a chance to take a class with him, I would highly recommend it. I, he didn't offer any while I was there, which was a huge bummer, um, oh. but I, he was just getting started and uh, as, an, as a professor. So I think he should have one. On, he might have one now on climate impacts, but um, would highly recommend taking that. Great. Um, and other, are there any other course recommend, uh, recommendations that you have? Any favorite courses that you think every hair student should take or every hair student interested in energy environment? I, ooh. well, I don't know who teaches it now. Steve Sakala taught the environmental econ Harris mm -hmm. course while I was there, which was amazing. Um, I would, thank you. I would definitely, recommend taking program eval. I think that was the most helpful course because it teaches you, you know, the general tools, the toolkit that we use in causal inference for economics. So you learn your difference of differences, your regression discontinuities, and, you know, why we do these instead of doing an RCT in a lot of cases. And I think that's the most important kind of class if you want to, um, want to engage with the environmental economics literature um these would be just it would just it's a it's a really i don't know who teaches it now it was grogger when i was there it was really well taught and i learned basically how to code these things in r and i think stata as well and um was very helpful for interviews um technical interviews for uh ra jobs right um and then were you involved in anything else while you were at Harris um, that helped add, add to your skills or interest in energy? These are like any other types of internships or clubs or volunteering, um, anything like that? Um, let's see. I think a lot of the social events at Harris were great because they were very fun, first of all. And second of all, you get to speak with a lot of people at Harris who are approaching energy from a different perspective and who want to, and who have different experiences uh, in that field. So I think talking to them about kind of, you know, where they want to go, what they want to do, how people do those things, you know, what are the, what are people talking about in say like um, energy investment? I think you guys had Andrew Bray talk here before too, who, definitely comes at these issues in a lot, in a much different way uh, than I do, and seem to always have a good conversation with him and others um, about just topics in, in energy. So I would say just speaking with your network is probably, what in whatever event you can find them at is a, is a great opportunity. Yeah. And then as far as experience goes, I think, you know, I, like I said, I tried a lot of different things while I was a master's student. Um, and one of those things was a Bartlett fellow with Epic. Um, do you guys still do the external fellowships? Um, mm, not really. Potentially. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do want I do want to talk about um, your experience with that. So if you want to talk a little more about um, what you did do um, in during the mm -hmm. fellowship. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I would I really, I did this external fellowship. We were, I was in um, Copenhagen actually. So funding from Epic to kind of study um, climate impacts on forestry. And so I went and worked with some faculty at the in, in Copenhagen and um, started to explore this topic, found it sort of interesting, but ultimately realized it's something that I didn't want to pursue academically on my own. And so I think it was just, still a valuable experience to know kind of how to approach a topic, think about it, decide if it's something you're interested in or not, uh, especially before you start your PhD where you're kind of, it, it's, it, it may be hard to kind of uh, go back or, or change your, um, you know, your interests um, so dramatically, I guess, after the fact. So 
Um, I learned a lot though on that job and we, we still might have a paper that comes out of it, but um, that's to be determined. Yeah. Um, and a note on the Bartlett Fellowships, I am just taking this program over, so I'm still learning everything about it. So I don't gotcha. want to say that the external internships are completely out because I'm not super positive on that. Um, so just, I don't want to. Well, um, external ones are just as good. It's not bad. Yeah. So. Um, so this is the link to those um, fellowships that we're talking about. Um, but yeah, so if anyone has questions about those coming up, those applications will come up in the spring for the summer and then um, for the academic year as well. Um, and yeah, I'm, and I should say, oh, sorry. No, I should but, say that mine was during the summer. Um, I did mine during the summer, which is, um, you know, working full time, probably my first time working full time as a researcher. So uh, it was very great. exciting to have that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so then just what are some overall takeaways that you had from your experience at, at Harris? Like, can you say after graduating, I can do these three things or these are three things that I've you know, added to my pocket of skills? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think learning, definitely learning how to code was the number one thing that I needed. But I think learning how to code by itself is you know, not entirely useful um, in the sense that I think I found the teachings in economics and statistics to be important to understand why we were coding, what we were looking for. Um, I think in general, the statistics was helpful to understand, you know, the methods that we were developing and in in academic papers and then the economics was helpful to kind of understand the theory and why we think you know what what is an interesting topic what are the moving parts um, for this problem and so i think you know taking those courses seriously is is very important um, as 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 someone who wants to do research uh, because you'd be surprised how many times i like pull out just like a supply and demand curve and just like look at what's changing and and why and kind of what a policy of is trying to do by uh you know through that graph and so um either mentally or actually drawing it out these are kind of things we do actually pretty often in research and it, you, i think you'd be surprised how simple the model we create in our head in order to kind of go about doing doing research so um, I imagine maybe a lot of you are past the first year already. If not, um, you know, in either case, it's still important to, uh, you know, take those seriously and not just uh, do the, not just skate by on those classes, I guess. It's a lightweight All right. Um, so then just um future wise you know where do you see yourself after you finish this program and what do you want to do with this work um yeah you might have said this in your intro but again i missed it so i don't know <laughs> no so i want to be i think i went into this phd with the goal of becoming a professor and following that track um and so you know doing research um setting my own agenda, um, doing the research that I think is important and interesting. But I think a lot of people approach the PhD and do it differently. A lot of people in my program plan to go to government agencies afterwards at higher level econ positions. Um, some people go to Amazon or uh, some consulting, and then a lot of them join uh, international organizations such as IMF or the World Bank. And so um, I think I think we're about 50 50 on who wants to do profess who hopes to do professorships and those that don't. Um, but yeah, definitely on the would like to be on the professor track if possible. Right. Um, so in, in a dream world where you're at your dream university, um, what is the, what is the dream things that you are researching or teaching about? Um, do you have an idea yet? Oh. That's tough. Um, I've always found, 
I think I really want to focus on discussing and researching energy transitions, um, how we do them most effectively, um, how we specifically how government and you know public entities could take a role in changing um, our clean energy landscape. Um, and so I think just in that broad field, uh, you know, that transition itself and also just climate policy in general are two, two things I hope to be working on for, well, I hope to be working on it for as long as I need to, I guess, which, you know, if things, <laughs> if, uh, if we don't have to, if I don't have to do it for 50 years, that'd be great. And I could just focus on public economics, but, um, you know, for now, that's what I hope to, to endeavor, yeah, to focus on. I think at this point we will move on to the uh, audience Q&A. Um, so again, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. I will then unmute you and you'll need to accept that unmute to be able to speak. Um, say your name, what year you are, what school you're in, and then um, go ahead and ask your question. And I will mute you again afterwards. Now, Q and A is open, and it usually takes some people a little bit. Oh, we don't even have to wait till we already got somewhere ready. Um, okay, Max, I'm going to allow you to talk. You'll look. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Max. Hey, Trevor. Uh, sorry, Dean. Uh, so, so my name is Max. I'm a second year at Harris, and I'm also interested in uh, PhD programs in environmental economics. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of like the interdisciplinary work that happens at Cornell. So I've heard that there's lots of collaborations between different departments. People maybe study economics, but they also have someone who provides advice from other fields like ecology or something like that. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, maybe among your cohort, if there are any interests that kind of exist across those sort of boundaries, or if there are any kind of older students you've talked with who have uh, kind of interdisciplinary interests as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, you see a lot of this interdisciplinary work, in, especially in the food and agriculture um, economics work, but there are also, um, you know, faculty that work with other, um, other science uh, fields on campus or statistics or machine learning or, um, Maybe even the natural resources department, I think. Uh, Ivan Rudick does some work with them, um, who's in the energy, sorry, Ivan's an energy um, econ uh, professor here at Cornell. And so, yes, yeah, I think what I've been told is that when choosing your committee, um, Cornell Dyson, you know, is a little more flexible with who you could have on your committee uh, compared to other schools. So, you know, you could, your main chair has to be, you know, an economist, but I think you could choose committee members from across the, across the school. And um, so I think that's just one way you could be involved with, uh, with other departments. And I think it's encouraged if it's um, something you want to do. I personally uh, don't know much about that work though. So I can't speak too much about the actual research that um, is coming out of Cornell as far as inter interdisciplinary work. I would love for you to tell me sometime, actually. <laughs> Maybe in a few years. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Max. All right. Floor is again open. Um, thanks, Max, for jumping in for our first question. Um, I was going to say, usually uh, it takes people a little bit to ask their questions, and I have to go through my uh, additional questions um, before people raise their hand. Um, so. Um, yeah, so we can go back a little bit more and talk about um, your program until someone else raises their hand. Um, and let's see. This is a question I just personally want to know. How long is your program? How long do you think you'll be in it? I know it depends on research and stuff like that, but um, what's your estimated finish? <laughs> yeah, so um, it's typically five to six years. Um, and I hope to do it in five. I think that's what everyone says. <laughs> they they want to get out early, but I think 
Um, what was a shock to a lot of people when they entered was that most people do finish in six. Um, and a lot of that is because you are, um, you know, you write your dissertation, but your main focus on your last year is getting a job. And so you work on just one, one more paper, your job market paper, and work on making that really, really good so that your chances of getting a job are, are higher. Um, and so I think it tends to be more on the six or maybe even seven, depending on your funding. Um, and I think that's a shock to a lot of people who, um, you know, it wasn't, I don't think it was in very clear to me, or maybe I just didn't think it through all the way when I joined, but, you know, it was a bit of a shock to hear that it could be, you know, they tend to be um, more like six years, so. Okay. Um, and I, again, I'm purely asking because I've never applied for a PhD program. Um, so just information that I think is great for everyone to know. Um, when you are applying to, the, to this, um, do you focus more on like specific schools and um, those programs, or do you just kind of apply for a lot of things? I mean, a lot of people just for, for schools, applying for college in general, people have different um, ways of doing it where they apply for a ton of schools and then hopefully one of them works out or, you know, you have two, three, two or three favorites and um, really focus on those. Um, what kind of strategy did you end up doing? I think most people apply for more than 10. Um, and that's on the, yeah, on the, on the smaller side, um, or on the fewer side, I think people apply for about 10. I applied to 12. Um, and the advice I got when I would ask professors, you know, what, you know, what, I, what else I could do to strengthen my application, they said apply to 10 more. And <laughs> unfortunately, I had a budget constraint, so I couldn't really, I couldn't really make that work. But, um, I think a lot of people tend to go that route, but I think it's important to say that um, you should ask your, you know, if you if you have a research job, ask your, put a, together a list of schools, like in August, um, send that to someone who has agreed to be your letter writer and ask them if this list makes sense and ask them if you should add others, if you should delete others, um, anything like that. And so I think a lot of people don't end up doing this and they end up applying, they end up applying for schools that they maybe, you know, have a less chance of getting in or maybe that they not a good fit for ultimately. And so I think really relying on your, on your mentors for that is extremely important. Yeah. And then, yeah. so once you decide on one of your 10 plus schools, <laughs> Um, how does that application and process look um, after submitting an application, what the next steps are, how many interviews are there, um, are there other things that you need to submit for them to review, um, what does that look like? Um, usually in econ there aren't any interviews unless you apply to business schools, mm -hmm. um, so you might get an interview for business schools, but other than that you'll just, you'll receive an offer and decide by, what is it, April? March 15th or something on on whether on which one you decide so um, hang in there <laughs> it's been a really hard time those four months but um, yeah. yeah my next question was going to be about advice for doing interviews but since you didn't have to interview um, yeah, I didn't if you have any advice on that please go ahead <laughs> yeah no I didn't have to do those luckily so um, yeah All right, um, we still don't have any questions popping up, guys. Um, think of anything that you want to ask. It can be about Harris. It can be about the program. It can be about energy in general. Um, so, you know, ask away. Um, anyways, so back to my reserved questions. Um, at this point, so you have that um, team that you work with. Um, is there a mentor or advisor that um, you're specifically with the entire time through the program? Um, so when so hiring for econ, generally you get hired by the school, and then they mm -hmm. kind of leave it up to the faculty and the students to sort themselves um, 
into, you know, who they work best with and who they want to work with. Um, and so I came in without, you know, a direct mentor or advisor. Um, but I spent a lot of time this first year kind of doing informational interviews with with faculty who I might be interested in working with, whose papers seem to be very interesting and or who have skills that I might, you know, like to be able to emulate. And so I think for those who get into the even beforehand, you know, it's good practice now to do, you know, reach out to some faculty, ask to do some informational interviews just about, you know, ideas and research itself and um, you know, could be really helpful to help figure out the type of style of a mentor or uh, advisor that you, or chair that you might want on your committee. So we do have a Q, uh, question in the Q and A box. I'm going to read that out for everyone. Um, the question is, how do you build your profile up and find opportunities when applying for first time RA ships during the quarter without any prior research experience? Mm. Yeah, I had a hard time with this too. Um, I had no coding background when I came into Harris. I basically just knew the only technical skill I really had was, you know, ArcGIS. Um, and so I didn't, what I found helpful was I started to, um, I applied for the e, e lab as kind of a poly, as, as a, um, it wasn't an RA position. Uh, ex what was it? It was like a policy um, person. So I did some literature reviews and stuff like that. And once I was kind of working in that role, I was able to ask for more um, research tasks, which ended up um, is kind of how I was able to start doing some more RA type duties. But um, just don't be afraid to apply to, I would say if I could go back, I would have just applied for the RA jobs and not try to take this um, longer route to getting those uh, those jobs. If you know how to, you know, code, if you know how to do the skill, or if you really want to learn, I think it's okay to just say that as well in these interviews and discuss other times that you've developed the skill on the job or how you plan on, you know, learning these skills or or how you've learned them already and haven't had the chance to or the opportunity to to use them. I know it's intimidating though. It's uh it could be hard, but I think telling them that you're willing to learn it goes a long way. Great. Thank you for that question. Um Again, questions are still open. Um, I'm going to go very broadly right now and ask about um, what you think are some of the biggest current issues and trends um, in the energy and economics field um, that you think we should be aware of. That's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this question. I was, or, and I've been thinking about it for a little bit, and <laughs> um, I think what we see a lot of what I see a lot of work on is going to be a lot different than what your faculty, your other professors see a lot of work on, um, or, you know, your answer will be different no matter who you talk to, but I see a lot of work on, um, let's see, I think a big energy change that we're going through right now is, you know, residential and buildings changing how, changing out of, um, using fossil fuels. So, you know, your your heating is generally by natural gas, it heats your boiler and it, you know, radiates out of your radiator, out of floorboards. And so there are like these policies that are going into place that are like California just banned natural gas and new home construction. New York City just banned uh, natural gas and new construction. And so this like transition away from natural gas is a really, um, I feel like going to be a really interesting field um, in the next few years. Um, and then also on the regulation side, I think there's a lot of discussions about um, how to regulate uh, energy and electricity itself. And I know Steve Sakala also, to bring up his name again, has worked on this a lot and he has a very entertaining Twitter feed about it and so definitely worth a follow. Um, 
so those are two big, you know, topics that I have been paying attention to a lot lately is this, yeah, this residential and building change and regulation, I guess, in general, and these, you know, city to state to federal level um, policy changes and to, to try to encourage uh, changes in, in our energy mix. And so I feel like those are the most exciting topics. Uh, um, and I think, I think a word you will find a lot of is, uh, you know, maybe looking, I'm trying to think maybe more broadly, if you were to be interested in um, other environmental econ topics would be just kind of looking into, you know, while you're at Harris, if, um, I think a lot of people apply um, general fields of interest to environment and energy topics. And so um, a lot of people like to start, a lot of people are like industrial organization or public econ or finance people who find, you know, the setting of environment and energy really captivating. And so they approach it from this like new perspective. So, you know, while at Harris, it might be worth looking into classes such as such as those. Great. We have actually a question in um, a hand raise and a question in the Q and A. So those might be our last two, unless anyone else has more that pop up. Um, so Max has another question. So Max, welcome back. Hey everyone. Hey Dean. So I, this is kind of funny because I'm actually very interested in building electrification as well. I feel like I've stumbled into this like small room of people who are very interested into this niche thing. I was wondering. Um, <laughs> heat pumps right max yes yeah exactly i was wondering like um yeah just like what what role you think like economic research can have to help uh facilitate this transition or like what are some of the concerns that you think researchers should have about this uh transition from households using um you know gas powered stoves and heaters to electric powered uh, stoves and heaters um sorry i might so the question is how a researcher could think about these? Yeah, or it's like, so what, maybe, maybe like, what are some of the, the issues at play? You know, like what are some of the Well, the I think um, natural gas is, is still extremely cheap. Um, it's really easy. It's um, baked into a lot of homes that are already built in the Northeast, especially. And so, you know, getting people off of that, that, that path dependency is really tough. And I think in order to do that, it requires regulation at the federal, at probably the federal level on how we price gas itself. So obviously putting a cost on the gas is probably the most important thing we could do in order to level the playing field, um, which I'm sure is not news to anyone who's in this chat, um, who attends NEU Chicago uh, Energy and Environment <laughs> seminar, but I think that's, you know, the primary thing we could do, but there are other proxy less efficient ways of handling that as far as like a public econ uh, topic. And that includes like pricing the alternative, uh, incentivizing the alternative is one way of doing that. And so I think state entities could take a role in um, incentivizing, you know, transitions or switches or, um, you know, things you know, getting people on a, onto a heat pump and, and paying them to do so or giving them, you know, some, some amount of money to do that or, you know, encouraging in, in those sorts of ways or reducing information barriers to doing those things. I think there's a lot that um, public entities could do to, to help the transition as well. Cool. That's super helpful. Thanks so much. We, we should talk about it more though. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Okay, so we have a Q&A question. Um, all right, from your experience, is it absolutely necessary to develop skills in Stata? It's Stata, not Stata, right? Stata? Stata, Stata. Yeah. Stata, ugh. When looking for RA ships and applying for PhDs or is R sufficient? If yes, any resources that you recommend for Stata since Harris is mainly R-based? Um, this is a good question. I have a really annoying answer and then a more helpful answer. The annoying answer is learn both. Um, they're both extremely helpful and 
the reason why will also be my answer to the sufficiency question is that a lot of older professors who have been in this field for a long time use data and they typically are the ones who are hiring and they need someone who could do work for them in a way that they understand and, and a, you know, they, they're better managers at, at using that software specifically. However, there are also a lot of people who are switching to R. I think it's a lot more common um, now as well. And so I, when I went on, when I was applying for jobs, I said I could do both and um, kind of chose which one that they preferred. But, you know, some people will want someone in R specifically or want you to be able to use certain packages specifically as well. And so that's helpful. Um, but in order, you know, just to give you a sense of why I say both is I applied to 63 jobs coming out of Paris. Um, half of them were R jobs, half of them were Stata or, or, you know, some of them were Stata jobs specifically, some of them were, you know, with however you could get the job done. Um, I think um, a lot more people are saying, you know, however you can get the job done. But again, the Stata one is just kind of what econ professors tend to use. Great. Um, okay, so we're going to start wrapping up unless anyone has any last minute questions. Um, thank you for those. Um, we'll put those in the Q&A box and for Max. Um, okay, so thanks, Dean, for joining us. Again, I'm sorry about those wonderful difficulties, um, but we persevered and we made it work. Um, so we're, we're, we did, we did good. Um, our next career series is going to be on February 8th. Uh, we'll have Brandon Charles. He's also in a PhD program, so I'm sorry that those two happen to be back to back. That's just kind of how it worked out. He's in the public administration PhD program, so um, go ahead and register for that. Um, our series is up on our website. Um, we will update with the spring quarter ones soon, um, but we will not have one in March, so just in January, February, um, and no March one this year. Um, so thank you again for joining us. If you want to connect with Dean, um, Dean, you can either put your email in the chat and post it, or you can, anyone can connect with me and I can connect you with Dean. Um, yeah. You're comfortable with. Yeah, either works. I will post my, you, I'll post it here. And you could definitely feel free to send this out as well. Cool. All right. Um, so that's it today. Um, I hope everyone is having a good first week and see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you.